Okay, this is the first section of Unit 8. Um, Unit 8 is the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, we kind of divide it up by different categories there. The first two sections are mainly the 1920s, but there are some things that will go into the 30s here. And then the C, C and D are of the early Great Depression, and then D is more of the New Deal. Um, for state standards for this section, you will find that a lot of this is not of the most interesting things. A lot of things that are going to be in, especially section B, are not going to be questions on the EOC. Um, there are a lot of the stuff that you're most interested in. A lot of your questions you're going to have on your EOC are going to be the more boring things um, that you have to know on there, the political side of this. Um, there, but that that isn't true for everything. But a lot of times, when you're thinking about the Roaring Twenties and jazz and the flappers, you're not going to have much on that side. Where you're going to have a lot more on the political side um, there that you have. Our bracketing dates here. This is where for the Twenties we kind of look and see for what is the aftermath of of World War One, um, going through the stock market crash there, and then the Thirties with Great Depression um, there, but um, that we have. That's for later on. Okay, World War I ended. We had uh, on the last section there, we had this is kind of coming back to it. Um, on your EOC, you will probably have some sort of question dealing with the League of Nations, the Treaty of Versailles, the 14 points on um, there. They're all interconnected together on um, there. Our president's the person that came up with the 14 points with President Wilson. It is what most of the world went by with the Treaty of Versailles. They will add other things like reparations that we had and we'll come back to that in the beginning of World War II. There, the most controversial side um, of it for the United States was the League of Nations. And even though our own president came up with this idea, we will actually never sign the Treaty of Versailles. We will make our own separate treaty. We will never join the League of Nations. Because the United States is not in the League of Nations, a lot of the things that are going to happen in the 20s and 30s um, that are going to try for world peace, um, they will not be as successful on there. We are not the only fault of this um, there, but we are a major part because coming out of World War I, the United States was the number one power in the world. We weren't quite ready to accept that challenge. Um, we're going to have where we're going to be some things we're stepping forward. There's other things we're going to be isolationist uh, for what we're doing. Okay, we were, I mentioned about isolationists. We weren't always isolationists, and sometimes we will lead. Um, the biggest th thing that you can kind of look at this will be the Washington Naval Conf Conference or the Washington Conference. Um, this is going to deal with one of the causes for World War I, which was the fact of militarism. So the idea was to decrease the size of the military. In this case, it was more for the Navy. Um, you see here is the proportions that we have. It's not five ships there, but the ratios that, that we would have. Um, have on there a question about how did this actually help Japan in the Pacific. This is where you kind of look at things. The United States has to worry about two, net, two oceans with the Atlantic and the Pacific. Japan only had to worry about the Pacific. So on the surface, you could look and say, well, Japan was ahead of us two and a half to three. But there are several things. First of all, we do have not long before this is where the um, the Panama Canal was completed so that we can shift our Navy um, from one side to the other of the world if we, we need it easier. The fact also that we know that for Britain they are our best friends and Brit British Navy we're kind of together um, there with our allies. Um, the problem that we have though with the Washington Conference was a lot of the navies later on will not obey this. The, the mechanism to try to force them to obey was the League of Nations, but the League of Nations was not there um, because of the United States not being in it. It did not have the power. And so when later on in the 1930s, when nations would, would not follow the agreements to this, that would cause problems. 1928, we will have one of the greatest things in the history of the world, we got rid of war. Thank goodness we never had a war after 1928. Well, as you can tell that this did not ex actually succeed. But in 1928, we will have the Kellogg-Briand Pact that is signed by 62 nations. What it said is that you would only defend yourself. You would not use war as an instrument of foreign policy on um, there. In other words, you would not aggressively go after someone else. If all those big nations obeyed it, there wouldn't be any problem because if you're only going to defend yourself, there'll never be a fight. 
Now, what was to enforce this? Once again, the League of Nations, because if a nation broke this and they were aggressors, the rest of the world, led by the League of Nations, would then come against them to punish them. Um, we will see something like this happen in history in the 1990s, when we will have um, our Iraq attack the little country of Kuwait, and then we will have multiple countries come together to push Iraq out of it, led by the United States in that case. But for the kellogg briand Pact, this won't be successful um, with, because of the lack of the, of the um, League of Nations. So when we give an example of Mussolini and Italy attacking Ethiopia in the 1930s, the rest of the world looks the other way um, with this. Again, the idea was good. Jane Addams wins a Nobel Peace Prize uh, for this, a lady that had the settlement house, the whole house before um, here. But this all will eventually not stop war. Okay, the Dawes Plan. This isn't the Dawes Act, the one that we had from the 1870s, 1880s with the um, American Indians unit in here. This is the Dawes Plan. Um, don't know any way to make this any simpler, but you, um, there, it's just straight out, it's a flow of money. And if you look at that chart down there, that triangle on the bottom, that is where you will need to know. Now, it's a cycle of payments. The United States, we were giving loans to Germany which Germany was using that to pay off the reparations to the Allies, Britain and France, and Britain and France were using the money from the reparations then to pay back loans. This circle of money, you say, well, the money's going just in circles. Yes, that's how economies work um, there. When it's stagnant, that's actually bad, but it's working um, with things here. Um, and this is actually helping um, Germany. But in the stock market crash of 1929, we will stop. Um, and there, um, this is where we will actually make the recession and, and worse in Europe, particularly in Germany. And through this, where Germany was already in bad shape, they're going to be in a lot worse shape than after that. That is where Adolf Hitler emerges. Um, a lot of them, Europeans did not like that the United States did this. This is where we kind of do take an isolationist policy um, in here um, when, we, when we do this. But that circle of money. Um, those last three things, the the Washington Naval Conference, the Dawes Plan, and the kellogg briand Pact, you're almost for sure going to have a question about one of those three or some version of it um, on your EOC, just the way the standards are written. So I know they're not real exciting, but definitely make sure that you know which is which of these things in here. So here's a question, an example here, if that could be for the kellogg briand Pact. Here's one that would be for the Dawes Plan um, in there. All right, during the 30s, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit. This is kind of in here instead of doing this the Great Depression section in here because it kind of goes with this. Um, what will end up happening in the 1930s, and we're going to come back to this in the beginning of World War II there is in the timeline before it starts there. The United States will be more isolationist in here. And we will actually even officially be isolation because, because when things are happening in other parts of the world, we will officially... Um, release neutrality acts and pass those in Congress. Now we're going to break those down more later on and see where, yeah, we weren't exactly as neutral as we said we were. Another thing that happened at this time, the America First Committee um, in here, and this is where we were, this is an isolationist group. Um, don't get it confused with Donald Trump's American First there because the American First for Donald Trump was the idea of the foreign policy that we put American interest in, in front of others. In this case, though, this is more isolationist, but the reason why it sometimes has a negative connotation is sometimes some of the people that were saying for isolation were actually supporting, or even if they weren't purposely, it was, it was helping to support the Nazi Germany. Um, this is where it will include Charles Lindbergh, um, other people. Again, the amazing thing is, is even this isolationist attitude um, that we have, even after Pearl Harbor, we will actually have multiple senators and representatives that vote against us going to war. The time that this really shows is when we start going through and reviewing over the world history before World War II, the Spanish Civil War and the Munich Conference, where we don't get involved um, in there. And uh, by us not getting involved, this will actually help the fascists as they go to power in Italy and in Germany. All right, the economy um, in there. After World War I, we will have a short recession um, in here. And this is because of demobilization. You have to have a time to retool the factory. We're not going to be making tanks. We're going to be making trucks again. So 
There was that short recession. We are going to have uh, that recession in 1919. This will be some of the causes that we will have of the, the race riots in multiple cities. 1919 was not a, a good year. A, a couple different things that were happening. This is also when the Spanish flu was still affecting um, there, much like the pandemic with COVID um, 101 years before where we will have that. But, the, but after that short recession, the economy is going to boom. And you're gonna see the same thing happens after World War II. We have a short recession, and then the economy is going to be moved. So the 20s and the 50s are very similar. Why did it happen? Well, both of those decades, the war will force companies to be more productive um, per employee. They're going to use a lot more technology. When you don't have the number of workers that you normally have, you find ways to make those workers more productive. So things you might have wanted to do, you made sure you did. Even where I give the example a little bit for farmers. Farmers are going to update their machinery that they have this. Um, and there, the technology again gets better. The goal from World War One is going to be be coming in during World War One and afterwards as as Britain and France are repaying their loans to the United States. Our government policy was very pro-business and we're going to see that also happens after World War II um, there. So all of these are aspects that are going to help the economy after both times in here. There were signs um, there that there were flaws in it and there I say I have the question why were the flaws ignored? Well for the most part everything looked good. And that's where a lot of times we are positive. Um, I use for our current economy right now, overall things, even with COVID um, in there, we have some, some things that overall the economy looks good, looks like, like there that we are fine overall, but there are some definite flaws that we have that maybe in the future we look back and say, we need to correct this um, there. For the last time in your notes, which is I think it's about the fifth time in your notes though, during the 1920s, it'll be the end of the Great Migration, where it started back in the 1870s. It will peak in World War I, but where we will have African Americans moving from the segregated South to northern cities. They're going there for, for jobs. Um, as we watched, though, they was not everything was that great for them in the northern cities. The race riots of 1919 were there. We're going to see that instead of segregation by law or de jure, we're going to have unofficial or de facto segregation um, there that will come. And this will be where we're going to look in the civil rights, where we're going to have two different civil rights movements. Okay, here is a graph that you kind of see for the unemployment where we have that short recession. And then after that, the economy, which anytime your unemployment rate is below 5%, that is a, a good sign for the economy um, there that you have. All right, for farmers. World War I was really good for the farmers because they were able to, to um, sell their, their goods not only to the United States but to Europe. They will, with the high prices for the food, they will update a lot of things where before World War I we probably had around half of our farmers using um, mechanical tractors. By the end of World War I almost all were. We will have advances in different things scientifically like um, herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers um, there, different hybrids of crops because we're, again we're trying to make every farmer more productive. Now all these advancements are going to make it where each farmer and each acre is able to produce more food um, there, which is good for us because normally when you have more things that um, there the supply goes up, normally the price goes down. Europe is at, at peace. So once they are able to rebuild, they are buying less and less, so we have less demand on that, which usually if there's less demand on our products, the price will go down also. So both of those things will be more supply, less demand will go for lower prices. That's good for people going to the grocery store, that was not good for farmers um, in there. So, and this is where we kind of go for the basics of supply and demand. Um, there, you're going to spend a lot more time on it in the in the future. You're going to see some of these graphs on the next page. Um, there, I spent a little more time in class going over just the basics of it um, here. But the problem that you have for the farmers at this time is many of them would would then go and the way that they solved their problems of trying to make more money is they would plant more crops. But that actually made the problem worse because that would increase the supply, which would also then lower the price along the way. 
During the 1920s, by the time we get to the mid-1920s, American farmers were in very hard times. We have a lot of them that are being foreclosed. But long before the stock market crashed in 1929, farmers are going to be in the Great Depression um, in here. And that's one of the signs for the economy not being so good. And it's going to, after the stock market crash, get even worse with the foreclosures. We're going to find that that's one of banks and farmers are two of the first things that that we're going to have to face and take care of as a problem in the in the 1920s. All right, with these different graphs, this is where we're kind of explaining in there. You're going to have a lot more about this in economics. You will not have a question on your EOC with this, but the basic ideas of supply and demand, um, which you should have had in seventh grade um, for the ideas that you had in here without the graphs are things that you need to know with this. All right, we will have some things happening with unions in the 1920s um, there, but overall, um, there was not as much union activity after 1919. Now, what factory owners have seen was with the Bolshevik Revolution and the unions were ones that, that the workers overthrew the factory owners. So what they did is they're going to go after unions, and this is where part of the Red Scare, that'll be part of the la labor agitators that we're going to go after in there. But they're also going to go, and they're going to go, and they're trying to... Try to, to curb some of the power of the unions by a lot of things that they would be demanding even give before. So an example would be is if your boss went and gave you a little bit of a raise and you weren't even asking for one at that time, you get more of a positive attitude. So why pay union dues if your boss is already doing things without it? Or you, you're going to get an extra week off of vacation or more safety is being done without the unions there. At the same time, we're going to have laws that are going to try to curb it. Um, I'm going to introduce this idea of closed shops and open shops too. It'll come back again in, um, in the 1950s, and it's also going to be something you're going to have in economics and government also. A closed shop is a law that says that, that for certain industries you must join a union. An open shop says that you, do, that you don't have to. And this is where today the term for that in government is right to work states. Um, there. Florida is a right to work state. You do not have to join a union. I am a teacher. We have a teacher's union. Since Florida is a right to, to work state, I have the choice of whether or not if I want to join the union um, there. Um, this picture on the bottom right hand corner, um, I know I've, I showed that before, but as a reminder in there about sit down strikes in here. And I have the question all right, why are they sitting? Okay, and this is where, this is in the 1920s, when we will have a lot of your strikes, our sit-down strikes um, there. It'll come back in the 50s, and the idea, again, when you have a strike for a union working for something, instead of being outside protesting they, um, there, you sit down. That way they can't bring in scabs to take your, your place and work. All right, politically for the 1920s, it is the Republican decade because all three presidents that are elected during the 1920s are, are Republicans. Um, there. The Democrats were having a hard time in this decade because there was a huge faction in the party. Their two strengths were the Deep South, which were very segregationist, and there, and then Northern cities um, there, which was based on immigration. And when they would come to a national convention, it was hard for them to work together. Um, we will have Warren G. Harding that is elected in 1920, his return to normalcy. Um, he, we're going to know, we're not going to know much about him during his presidency, but afterwards we'll know and we're going to see this with some of the scandals that he, that he has. He will die. Um, Cal, his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, will take over. Calvin Coolidge wins an election in 1924 on his own. Nicknamed Silent Cal at that time, he was seen as one of the greatest presidents, but later on in history, He's kind of seen as more of an average president um, there because of some of the flaws that we see. 1928, Herbert Hoover is elected. Herbert Hoover is unfortunately for him going to be best known for with the Great Depression starting. Blame it on Hoover, but he doesn't not he's not president for not even a, an entire year before the Great Depression starts. So it's not really his fault. But when you're president, you get too much credit and too much blame for what happens. For Al Smith, um, the Democrat that Herbert um, Hoover defeated, he was actually one of the top candidates for the Democrats, but a problem that he had was he was Catholic, and that was something that was still in America at that time, 
very anti-Catholic when people would run. And we will not have a Catholic president elected until we will have John F. Kennedy elected in 1960. And our second Catholic president won't be elected until 2020 um, there with Joseph Biden in it. All right. The thing about it is, with those pictures of the three presidents there, the fourth guy, he's actually the one that is the most important. This is Andrew Mellon. He was a Secretary of Treasury. Uh, for Andrew Mellon, the reason why he was so powerful is he, he made it where it's very business friendly. So part of the reason why the economy was booming. But a lot of the people that were in office, like Andrew Mellon was one of the five richest men in America. Um, there and a lot of the people that were in high positions in the government were also very rich and What ends up happening is we have have some things they don't fill Than what normal people have they're not used to grocery shopping um, There I, like I take it today where where if you're driving down the road if you if you're driving a car You notice if gas goes up five cents or ten cents, um, but if you're a billionaire Do you notice that on um, there? So they so again, they didn't realize what was happening here um, One of the philosophies we're going to have which this is something else you're going to come back to both in government and economics And we're going to have it later on in the 1980s too is trickle down economics or in your notes write supply side economics um, there, history-wise, we usually call it trickle-down, <coughs> and economics and government, we usually call it supply side. The idea that you would have is that you will cut taxes for corporations, for the rich, and what will happen is if you cut the taxes for them, then they will end up putting more money into their businesses, and that will create more jobs, and ultimately, you'll actually have more tax money come in um, there. Um, down on the bottom, there's the Laffer curve, which you'll notice there's no numbers on it, which kind of shows this idea that you have in, the, uh, in there. And when you're in economics, you will say that more um, in it. The problem that we have is we don't know what the perfect tax rate is, and we constantly are changing it. Where So we have it. Trickle-down economics, supply-side economics has worked at times. One of the best exa examples of this will be in the 1980s with Ronald Reagan. We also had John F. Kennedy um, pushing for it that, that helped us out of recession in the early 60s. But there have been other times in history, which you can see with here for the 1920s, that it hasn't happened um, there. And it actually ultimately didn't help um, in here. Um, in the 1920 election, where kind of how and out of touch some people were, Hoover thought at that time poverty was going to be eliminated very soon. Instead, we will then go massively into the Great Depression. We'll have Keynesian economics in the, net, in the 1930s on um, there. And again, those are both things you're going to go deeply into in economics and government. For President Harding, um, again, he will pass away. After he passes away, we find out about all kinds of scandals, both personal, but we're focusing just on the, on the um, scandals that he had in office. Um, he had a group of friends that were, were his party buddies um, there. They were known as the Ohio Gang or the Poker Gang um, there. He appointed a lot of the people that he was drinking with, even though it was prohibition and alcohol flowed freely through the White House. Um, there, he, he appointed them to high-level positions, much like President Grant had done. Uh, there, usually not a good idea to put the people you party with in important positions. Now, he will die, and after he dies, we'll find out about all the scandals. The one scandal you need to really know about is the Teapot Dome scandal. Um, the it's a it's a basically a hilly area in Wyoming. It looked like. From a distance, I don't see it, but I'm um, there. But it must look like a teapot for where it got na na nicknamed for it. What had happened to make long story short is the Secretary of the Interior, Albert Fall, approved for a lease of the land. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was for, but something like for for cattle or something like that. Very very low money for the lease, but it gave the company there the mineral rights on um, there. Well, lo and behold, they will find there's a bunch of oil and they will make a lot of money off of the government land. Later on, Albert Fall will have a lot of money that is in, in, his, in his bank account. So we know that there was a kickback to him. He will be convicted um, there. This will be the biggest scandal um, that we will have up to this time period in American history and basically will be the biggest scandal until Watergate will come around um, there. But that's that will be a major scandal, but again, Harding, he had, he had passed away. We didn't find out about this till afterwards um, in there. 
Again, the Ohio gang or poker gang are um, Harding's, for us to see. All right, coming back to the Red Scare, um, and here we touched upon it at the end of World War I. Um, during the 1920s, we are going to have it where we're scared of communism because of what happened in the Bolshevik Revolution. We are afraid it's going to happen in America, and we are going to try to round up anybody that's un-American, and that's going to be a, a theme um, in here. So the government is going to go after people that are communists, anarchists, socialists on there, what are seen as labor agitators on here, anyone that is radical um, in here. They're going to use the Espionage and Sedition Acts that were passed during World War I to continue on, and they will take away the, the liber liberties and freedoms of people um, there that they have. I talked before about the Sacco and Vanzetti case where, where they, they were definitely not, not good people um, in there, but the case that they were convicted on, there really wasn't much evidence, but they were immigrants, they were anarchists, they were Italian um, there, they were then put to death um, in here. But the Red Scare is going to be where the government's going to use this to go against immigrants and unions. And we're going to see where bills are going to be passed to stop the number of immigrants. In the, right before World War I, we're going to have, have the, the KKK start to grow. And it will grow slowly during the, the teen. And then in the 1920s, for a short period of time, it will grow to be the biggest that it has. Towns are going to have claverns um, there, and it's not just in the south. That's a big misconception that you're going to have. In fact, actually, some of the strongest areas are going to be in the Midwest. And what happens is it, it becomes where, for middle-class white America, um, something that people want to join these claverns, okay? That's your local things, almost like it's the Rotary Club or the Elks Club or some club like that. Um, in here and I'm going to be showing a video in class that goes over some of the history of it where it grows and you're going to see where it grows in the millions of people. You're going to have it where churches are going to be involved um, with this um, there. Now what happens is the Klan is going to be against anything that is basically not WASP. All right, I'm not making this up. This is actually a history term. WASP stands for White Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Now, here's where you look at it. The white is pretty self-explanatory. But Anglo-Saxon, these are people that they could trace their ancestry to Northern Europe on um, there, England, Scandinavian countries on um, there. And then the Protestants, they're, not, they're against people that are, even if they're Christian, but they're Catholic. So the, for that side of it. Um, Teutonic stock, that's basically meaning that you have good bloodlines um, um, for you. So this is where we're going to have it. Now, some of you may look at this and see, okay, Teutonic stock um, in there. This is kind of sounds like some of the things that Hitler was saying. Yes, and this is where we're going to have um, and here. And this is where they're going to wrap themselves up in um, the American flag and churches um, in here. And they're going to be against anything that is not seen as American or Protestant Christian, so they're going to be against Jewish people, they're going to be against Catholics, they're going to be against anybody that's communist or anarchist on there. Now, they're still going to be against the blacks, and in the South, that's actually still strong with them. Um, video on the show will have a lot more where I don't have much in the notes here about the state that was actually the biggest um, Klan state was Indiana, and it was led by this guy David Stevenson, kind of tell the story about what happens to him um, here. And, most, and you, so you think, okay, Indiana, that's up in the north. Yes, and this kind of shows for Indiana where they were against people that were immigrants. They were people against, that were Catholic or Jews that they were going against um, in here. Now, eventually the KKK is going to, to die down um, in there, and, but again, for a short period of time. Um, don't have it, I don't think, in the notes right here, but this is where you need to know the phrase 100% Americanism. Um, Rosanna Latin, please call the please call the Part of this that comes, which we'll see, is this um, in here, this movie called Birth of the Nation will be a movie that was made that will help revive, revive it um, in there. One of, the, one of the greatest silent movies that was made, but it's not real good on history as it basically goes and it, and it makes it where the KKK during the Reconstruction was seen as the protectors of whites, white women, and for Christianity on there. But it glorifies the KKK and helps to to raise them up. Okay, here in Florida, there's a couple things you need to to have, which basically during the 20s and the 30s, um, there. One of them, very close to us here in Citrus County, is the Rosewood uh, massacre. So. 
county that, that borders ours to the north is Levy County. Um, we will have this little town of Rosewood, which was a, a predominantly black town, um, was seen as a black middle class town in that area. Um, what ends up happening and the way that it starts is that, the, that there was a, a white woman who was having an affair. Um, the person she was having an affair will, will actually physically abuse her. She does not know how to tell her husband about this. And so she accuses um, that a black man came and had, had abused her and raped her um, in there, which then we will have looking for, for this black man. They will, will then have this mob go around. And there are different things we know where I say at least um, six blacks and two whites were killed. It's estimated that over 20, 20 um, African Americans were killed or disappeared um, during this time period. For decades, um, there wasn't much that was seen with this um, in there because families were afraid. This town was pretty much burned down except for there was a one white, white man that actually hid some families um, there that, that you had. But, but we will have, and the, and the clan that was here in Citrus County will participate um, there at Rosewood um, with it, which um, some of you may look and say, wait a minute, when we were reading book in English, um, they are about to kill a mockingbird, it sounds familiar. Yes, same sort of thing that had happened in other areas. All right, one thing that you do also need to, to know here, another massacre, um, and there is the Okoe Massacre. Um, and this will occur in 1920, there was, and it started when a black man tried to vote and a coe outside of Orlando. Um, what will end up happening with this massacre will then be that this, the black areas um, there, they're going to be burned down. Um, we're going to have, again, they don't even know the actual number, but maybe as many as 50 African Americans um, that were killed um, during this time. And we'll just drive out the black families that lived in a coe um, in there. For lynchings, and this is where, again, that word lynching had it earlier in the notes, but you need to know that's when you're hanging without it. Um, and you'll know Florida, we were actually one of the worst states when it came for, for lynching um, there, but you notice that mainly in the south. Although you see some of the areas there along the Ohio River um, and that you have. All right, part of that going with it, which... Uh, they are against African Americans, and again, the rise of KK goes where the government was also against immigrants. But right before World War One, the government will have the Dillingham Report, and I know I had this on our immigration unit before, but this is where this was written and said, what are the problems that we have? Why do we have alcoholism in America? Why do we have crime rates in it? Why do we have unemployment? And pretty much Dillingham Report said, all our problems we have in America is because of immigrants. So, politically, they're going to go after, after immigrants. So, you have the KKK that's doing that in the social aspect of it, but you actually have for politics. In 1921, we will pass the Quota Act. The Quota Act will limit the number of immigrants to 3% of what the 19th census allowed uh, or had in there. So, to give an example, if, there, if we had 100,000 people that were of um, Italian ancestry, we would allow 3,000 people in a year that way um, here. We will change in 1924 to make it 2% of the 1890 census. Now, for those of you remembering back to our new immigrants, old immigrants, this is where a lot of our immigrants that were coming over came, at, came over after 1890 that were coming from Russia and Italy and Greece and those new immigrants um, there. So where we would then have a lot less. And so it was allowing more of the old blood and the um, immigrants. Um, they're the same people that the Teutonic stock was, was saying were the better for the KKK um, in there, but not the new immigrants that were having, which many of those new immigrants, again, they were from Eastern and Southern Europe. Most of them, many of them were Catholic or Jewish in here. Uh, so the Red Scare against communism, the KKK, all of this goes along with the political side where we have these anti-immigrant laws that are being passed um, in here. And to throw in here, for prohibition and marijuana laws, um, here, when we study prohibition um, before, and we'll come back to it in the social side here, <coughs> one of the reasons why it was passed was because a lot of people said, well, 
It's groups like the Russians that drink too much, and so prohibition was seen as a way to try to curb the behaviors of immigrants. For marijuana laws that were passed in the 1920s outlawing marijuana, the two main groups that were using marijuana were Mexican Americans and African Americans in the cities. So it was, a lot of this was focused on those groups that you have. All right, so you see here, this is where, you, this political cartoon, you've seen a lot of things with the funnel, like um, there, here's a little bit different one, and the idea, and you see on this side where all these people from Europe are coming over to America, but the idea is let's make it where we, we at this end, we're going to turn it around, and we're going to be more selective for who comes through here. Um, I'll show in, in class not only as a section for it, but we're going to have these giant parades um, that were done by the KKK, and it's, it's I mean, it's, it is, I mean, a lot of people, it's unbelievable of how strong it became. In the 1920s were the, was the height of the, of the KKK. All right, I'm going to touch upon this. We're going to come back more on this, but this is where for the 1920s, there was a false sense of prosperity. A lot of this was because of credit installment plans um, that you have. People were buying things with money they didn't have. Um, an installment plan is where you're going to, it costs $100, but you're going to put $10 down, then you pay $10 a week for the next 10 weeks. Yes, I know that adds to 110, but that's how they make extra money on you with interest on there. And as long as the economy is good and, and going into debt for, for some things is, is not a bad thing that you, that you have. There's some things like a mortgage that you can't afford to buy a house straight out for most people. So you have good debt and bad debt. Um, there. The problem that we had is for a lot of Americans, they overextended themselves. And this is where we're going to see speculation. We're going to see it in Florida on land. We're going to see it for a lot of people on stocks. And they're thinking the economy is just going to keep going up. Businesses that are thinking when their sales started going down, oh, this is just temporary and they will not they will not readjust um, for this and readjust their inventory. They'll just build up inventory um, there, which all of this will then come to a head um, and there during and, uh, some of the causes for the Great Depression in here. The 1920s, by the end of the 1920s, we are going to have the biggest um, range between the richest and the, and the normal working class people that we'll ever have in American history um, in there. And this distribution, the wealth, the most of this was going to the very rich in here. We also have the aspect of consumerism and advertising effects where, where we now had several decades of buying and you want to buy and you want to, you want to have the newest products that you just have to have in there. You want to live the good life um, there. And so you think somebody else has it. So that's where, but more and more people were living this, but they were going to debt to have this. And that's where the, uh, and, and it was, and again, a lot of this was the idea that you had to have these things um, in here. Um, I always like to show these, these um, cart, or these different commercials up. Kind of tells of the time there. I mean, men wouldn't look at me when I was skinny. All right, most women, did, they wanted to have curves, okay, at that time. Again, you didn't want to be real skinny because uh, there, same thing that you did not want to be tan. Because if you were tan, that showed that you were working outside. So the lighter skinned you were, the more the sure. Make kids husky, definitely something we don't worry about today. All right, you notice here that we have physicians in Santa Claus that are advertising for cigarettes. Um, that's it. All right, we're going to have more about Florida in the next section, but this is kind of where for Florida we're going to have a land boom in there. The economy is going to take off after World War I. It actually starts during World War I, but really will take off. And, we, and what will end up happening is the speculation that we have is going to be with land. And people were buying land sight unseen. Um, in here. And what ends up happening in what's called a bubble is eventually it's going to burst. Whoever's holding the paper last, they lose. And this is what's going to happen in Florida long before 1929. And to make it where about 1926, when this land bubble is bursting, we will then have several hurricanes that hit in 26 and 28 that are devastating hurricanes. Um, and they're some of the worst that we will have in Florida history. So, like farmers were in the Great Depression before the stock market crash 1929, Florida was um, here. 